Are you wanting to create a highly prosperous photography business doing what you love? Or maybe you have a great business already and want to up your game? Then you're in the right place. Master craftsman photographer Lucy Dumas and her guests are here to support you on your journey. Now here's your hostess and tour guide, Lucy. An investment in knowledge pays the best interest. And that is a quote by Benjamin Franklin. You might have heard of him. So before we get started, I want to remind you that I have a website, Lucy Dumas Coaching. And if you grab one of my gifts, one is an ebook called 10 Big Ideas for Marketing in the Real World, you will get the gift. And then you'll also get in my newsletter uh, emails so that you can get reminders of who the next awesome guest would be. So I'd love for you to do that. And also share this podcast with your friends. All right. So my guest today, I have enjoyed his Facebook chats. We've been Facebook friends for a while, but never met in person. And I met Tishorn Jackson in person at WPPI in Las Vegas. And I was so excited that he said yes to being on my show. So let me tell you a little about him. He is an award-winning wedding photographer. He's an educator traveling as far as Cuba, Nairobi, and Kenya to teach. In 2014, he created an online community for Black wedding photographers across the globe to help establish, nurture, and educate educate members of the community. And Tishorn is a charismatic hat-wearing photographer (laughs) that makes images that resonate. He had a pretty cool hat on at WPPI, as I recall, right? That's right. (laughs) That's right. One of many hats. And he has got a great voice. He documents portraits on film and during engagement sessions, and he's been in Essence, Brides, Huffington Post, Munaluchi Bridal, and more. He once was an architect, and then became a photographer in Dallas, born in Antigua. And he loves giving back to the photography community. So thank you for being on the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I'd love to know just a little brief share about how you got into photography, like why photography is what you uh, focus a lot of your time on. Or your life, well, anything you want to share? Photography was not something, this wasn't part of my plan at all. My plan when I came to this country at 16 years old was to be an architect. My dad is a builder in the Caribbean and then came to America. He's still a builder. He retired, but unretired because he can't stop building houses. Uh-huh. <laughs> so all I knew was architecture and all things construction. And I was married two years in and we took a Dave Ramsey class on Financial Peace University. I went back to school again for my second degree and I got headshots done. I was working at the firm, got headshots done when I switched departments. And I was like, that's a nice camera. And we learned about negotiating through Dave Ramsey. And I was at Target one afternoon. I saw a camera that I saw online. There's a the bottom of the barrel Canon Rebel XT. Mm-hmm. I said, I wonder if I can negotiate this camera. And I said, let me try the techniques I learned with Dave Ramsey. And I tried it and I got the camera for 23813. But the asking price is only $500. Mm. I only got the camera just to see if I can negotiate. Photography was nothing or nowhere close to my mind. <laughs> it was just and something was like, well, for fun. Like if I picked up a, no, I don't know, a I, saw or something. And let me see if I can use this saw to cut this. Nope. Foot. Wasn't nope. even a part of the plan. Again, all I cared about was architecture. Mm-hmm. But I tr- I got the camera because I wanted to see if I can negotiate something. Mm-hmm. So I bought the camera and I'm like, what do I do this thing now? Maybe I take a picture in the mirror like everyone, everybody else does. Mm-hmm. Maybe I take a picture of the flowers, which I did. Mm-hmm. And it sparked some curiosity over time. And I'm here now. The rest is history. So yeah. your destiny found you accidentally, it sounds like. Yeah. yeah. And I just, if you told me i will do all the things I've done, I would say, no, that's not the life I want. Mm-hmm. I love architecture. That's all I cared about. Yeah. So do you think there's some connection with your love of architecture and photography that that background helps you 
in your photography? It, it does, but it, sometimes it can be a challenge because if, I, if I'm in a space where there are a lot of shapes and perspectives, I get overly stimulated and I have mm. to slow way, way down. Like, okay, stop. Cause a lot happening here in terms of architecture and I want to be able to capture it. So sometimes it can slow me down <laughs> when I don't want to slow down. So when you're photographing, sometimes you see all that ar architecture it's, yeah. and it's, it's a lot because you've times. got just like we've got this brain that has developed the awareness in photography of colors or design or whatever mm -hmm. is a superpower for me. Color is one of my superpowers and, and I can't not see what's going on. Like someone's on stage and they're walking back and forth. I'm always looking at what's behind them and as they move. Mm -hmm. So are you saying for you, you're just always keenly aware of the architecture that's around Very you. Very aware. Loud way. Yeah. It's yeah. like a loud echo ringing in my ear. Like, okay, all right. Now that I see this and the average person typically won't see it, mm -hmm. but I'm seeing a lot of the, the facade of buildings, all the millions that are there and all these different things taking place. For the average person, oh, that's cool, but I'm seeing these things that I know very well. Right, right. I get overwhelmed when I'm in an environment that has so many possibilities that it's hard to narrow down to what I'm going to do with a family portrait outdoors. So is that part of that? Or is it just a like a mental visual distraction to you? It, sometimes it's a distraction, but it's, it also becomes a challenge because I want to make sure if I'm in this space, the architect and the design team took time to design it and build it. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that I can at least do it some level of justice for my own selfish, you know, selfish pride, because yeah. you know, that's my background. So are there any tips for people that don't have the background that you have in architecture for what to look for or how to design a photograph in a wedding? Like there's lots of architecture in that. Churches, yeah, the, the, the simplest tip I can tell you is to square up. Square up, meaning? Square up. For example, instead of shooting on at an angle, look for like the rectilinear shapes. If they're square, shoot square. Mm. That way, that's what, you know, horizontals are horizontals and the verticals are verticals. Not at a skew where it's like, a lot of architects see photos and they're like, why is it skewed? Like, why is it not square? Mm -hmm. So when I say square up, just stand square with the space you're in or the shape that's in front of you. And it's like shooting through a frame or a door. Make sure the right. verticals are verticals, horizontals are horizontals. Right, right. Keep it symmetrical. Got it. Do you also use lines as a design element? Um, like you might have leading lines or you might... Yeah, if, 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 if it's there, um, I try to use it whenever possible. Cool. Yeah, so. Yeah. There's a lot happening in the space. I'm like, let me just slow down and... Just, Get what I need to get and not get overly stimulated in whatever mm -hmm. space. Got it. So we met in person, as I already said, at WPPI, Wedding and Portrait Photographers International. I actually used to attend to Shana. I've been in business 41 years uh, now, and it used to be just WPI. And mm -hmm. I attended a few times when it was WPPI. I mean, WPI. Anywho, that's just a little trivia. And you were one of the featured speakers. What was your topic? What I or I know your topic, which is about not being a pushy. Don't be, be a pushy salesperson. Yeah. So can you tell us just in a nutshell or in a more than a nutshell, a whole basket's fine <laughs> about that yeah. topic? Why do you think that's something photographers would want to think about and know? Well, for one, a lot of people, they don't like selling to begin with. And because they don't like selling, sometimes they can be real pushy. Mm -hmm. And I hate being sold to, for one. If there's something that I want, I'll pay for it. You don't have to try to con me into buying it or push me to buy it. No, just like a lot of photographers, they'll even go to a consultation not having a system in place. And it's like, well, whatever happens, happens. No, if, if a couple's going to spend the time to meet with you, your job is to get the bag. Get, get the bag. It makes no the, sense. If the they are, what does that mean? It means get the money. Get okay? the money. <laughs> okay. they, they want to, they, they meet with you, right? Right. Which means they already like the work that you do. So why not go and just secure, secure it? We call it in the street, secure the bag. 
secure the bag. So how do we do that without being pushy? By having a system in place. If I said to you right now, welcome to McDonald's, can I? What's the response? Take your order. How do you know that? I've been to McDonald's more than once. Is it the same McDonald's or every McDonald's? Every McDonald's. So what does that tell you? That that's actually a script. Part of the system. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Every Johnson who coached the Mavs, he said systems wins championships. Mm. And I forgot that. And so what kind of systems for wedding photographers do they, do you recommend or you teach? Because I know. Okay. So about, I teach them for one, you have to listen. Okay. Okay. At a consultation, I'm not selling them anything. I don't sell them anything. I have a system that I've built over the years to where they sell themselves to me. Why I should be their wedding photographer. Mm. Okay. They, they meet with me. I mean, they love the work. They want to make sure I'm a you know cool enough person for them because I spend a lot of time with them. And I have a system in place. Like I'm going to listen to them. I'm going to ask the relevant and non-relevant questions. I'm going to you know have my narrative already there and some psychology that's involved, fear of loss, desire for gain, a lot of things that I've built in my consultation to where it's like when, it, when it's all said and done, they're like, I got to have this person. So I understand why you ask relevant questions. What's the purpose of asking non-relevant questions? Because people like to talk about themselves. Yeah. So what kind of questions for a bride and groom would you ask that aren't related to photography? As a kid, what did you want to be? Mm. You never know what the response is going to be. And that uh -huh. response could also be something that's tied to you. Right, right. Like, what are some of your hobbies? They could say, I left a garden. Oh, really? I have a garden in my backyard. What well, you mean? How's your crop this year? There's a lot of things you can ask that has nothing to do with photography or their wedding that can build a relationship. And I know that's one of your superpowers is the connecting. So I think I've kind of morphed one question to the next naturally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Tishon mentioned that that making connections, building relationships with people is one of his superpowers. So it sounds like that's the beginning of it. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're on the right path. So how else do you build relationships? I know these are like I'm just throwing these uh, boom, 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 and you've got such oh, great bye. answers. So I'm not the most social person, and my friends will tell you that's a lie, but they don't realize the struggle I go through to be sociable. Mm. I'm a naturally shy person. Everyone who knows me say he's not telling the truth, but they don't see what's happening inside of me when I have to go out in social spaces. Okay. So for me, once I'm out there, I start to have conversations with people. I love to ask questions, ask a lot of questions. Because I know asking questions, people tend to give the answers to test before even, you know, ask the right question. And for me, if you can listen to people, you know, this someone told me many years ago, she was a reporter. She said, we're talking about, I told her, it's about who knows, uh, who I know. She's like, no, it's not about who you know. It's about who knows you and what you do. Mm -hmm. and that's where connection starts. So for me, when I meet people, they know what I know. They know what I do. And I get to know the same for them. And when it comes to that now, I'm able to connect them with people who are looking for people like themselves. Like for example, uh, I was supposed to go on a photo walk with some friends of mine, and I was like, "It's forty minutes away. I'm not gonna go catch an Uber to leave the uh, Mirage." And I was end up talking to a friend of mine who came by the cafe to walk to meet me. I ended up talking, and she's like, "I'm looking to do X, Y, Z my business." And I said, "I know the right person." And I kid you not, five minutes later, a team of girls walked by, and I was like, "If they walk by, the lead is gonna be right behind them." And the person she needed to talk to came right right up. I said, let, let me introduce you. She's the person that you've been waiting to meet. Yeah. And she's like, wow. I said, because I paid attention to what my friends do. Uh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Like the way that I met you is I saw our mutual friend, Leon Johnson. And then he's also a connector. Would you agree mm -hmm. with that? And then he was just like, oh, this is Lucy. Lucy. You need to have him on your podcast and her and him and her and put us together with the connection. So that's kind of what you're talking about, right? Absolutely. Yep. Because he didn't have to say that or do that. Yep. And you didn't have to um, help that woman meet the person that you know was who she needed to meet. 
but it's Absolutely. your nature. You're a connector. That's what I do. So how does that, because I know so many photographers are afraid, first of all, afraid to sell. I think one of the driving forces behind the, I'll call it the shoot and share model of business is that fear of really having to sell and deal with people. So how did you figure this out? Or can you give some some tips? Uh, number one is to ask good questions and listen. And then number two was connecting people. So are there other things that you learned along the way? Yeah, itemize your, your process. Because, for example, early in my career, one question I never asked and I learned over time, is there something you want that you don't see? I had a, I had a great conversation one, one afternoon, the bride, her mom and her dad, I think the grandmother was there too. And groom, groom was there, groom to be. Constant, it was going, everything was going smooth. And they told me, I showed them everything I had to offer. They said, we'll get back with you. Mm. And I was flying out. Uh, I was in Miami, landed in Miami, flying to another, to go to, to another wedding. And the bride calls me. She's like, we want to thank you for the time. We loved everything. But we went with another photographer because you didn't offer us canvas at the time. And I was like, what? I, I have canvas. Nobody just never ordered them from me. So it wasn't part of my options. Uh -huh. And I learned, I said, you know what? Going forward, I need to ask them, is there something you want that you don't see? Mm -hmm. Because unless you ask that question, you never know what the answer is going to be. Right. Right. So when somebody says to you, we'll think about it and get back to you, that's when part of your system is to ask that question. Is that is that yeah. what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. So now I just I edit my process on a regular basis. Like, okay, if I forgot to access, add it next time. It's about just having a process. And my process could be different than your process. There's a lot of processes out there, but the goal is to have one. Mm -hmm. And it's like when someone dies, right? You you go to the coroner. You have to diagnose what the cause of death is. Mm -hmm. Didn't book you. I, what was the cause of not booking? Mm -hmm. And then if it's something that's consistent, what do you do now? You modify the process. Right, right. So I want to really highlight that to the listeners. To Sean and I, I believe part of why we've been successful in this industry is that we continued to problem solve. And um, for example, when I was doing weddings, I did them for 10 years early in my career. On the way home, my assistant and I would debrief the whole thing and we would think about uh, hitches and how we might, what I'm now, I didn't call it then, but how we could improve our process so that some of those tanglements or issues that came up, we didn't have those problems in the future. So I really love that what you're saying is, what I'm hearing is when you pay attention to what's going on and then think through what you could add or what you could take away, then you create a process that works for you. Am I on track with that? hundred percent. Because it's like, when you get, think about when people who work in corporate America and usually when they start a job, there's, they have a little handbook, right? Mm -hmm. Standard operating procedures, same, same thing. Like you got to have these things in business. And I'm not saying if you, you won't be successful without it, but you up your chances by having systems in place. Cause you know, as artists, we can be just, you know, go with the wind, you know, just, you know, like whatever. But I think as you mature in this business and you have a lot at risk, you have to really systematize your life. Right. And that makes it simpler, especially probably for the person that is a little more on the introverted side mm -hmm. that you can lean into your system and not just yeah. be out there winging it. Yeah, because here's what happens when you decide to extend your team, you have systems in place. Mm. If something happens to you, there's systems there, there's a handbook. Mm -hmm. But it's like the book, what's the book called? Um, E-Myth Revisited. Mm. Most of us own a job. <laughs> we can, the, the job doesn't stay open without us being there. Right. Because we have no systems in place. It's nothing we can just hand off to the next person. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's that job or that security 
underneath if you've got things actually figured out? Are you suggesting creating that handbook physically? I believe you should. And, and again, and it could be a living document because I don't think anything we do in this business, it's ever just, you know, it's, it's not just there. It's just you have to modify on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. A static is very dynamic. Right. So do you have another example of something where you realized, let's say on a wedding day, um, something wasn't working for you regularly and you like put in that thinking cap because you like hats. So you probably have a thinking cap <laughs> and you're like, I'm going to do this differently. And then it made a big difference. Yeah. Uh, um, one major thing was, I don't even want to say it publicly, but I'm not a fan of photographing details. Mm -hmm. These lay flat and things. I'm right. like, it's not breathing, you know, but I understand the value that it provides for those that, for one, the couple who loves it, they paid mm -hmm. for it, the designer who designed it and so forth. And it provides value for them because they get copies of those images and it's beneficial to their business. Mm -hmm. So now I'm like, if I'm scheduled to start at three o'clock, I might arrive at 2.30 just to get those things out the way. That way I can focus on breathing, living things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. From the day before and after destination wedding, I'm going to ask them, hey, bring all those things to my room. I'm going to photograph this stuff before the wedding, mm. before wedding day. Then on wedding day, I can just focus on what I need to focus on. Right. That's really smart. <laughs> One of the things when I was doing weddings, I realized there were two vendors that usually made the brides or the day run late makeup and flowers that was my experience so i told the brides to tell the florist and the makeup that they needed to arrive an hour earlier than they thought they did or that they needed to be done an hour earlier so that when they're an hour later they're right on time and then I started making out schedules that the brides would pass out to their guests and always build in half an hour because people don't think about, okay, I'm supposed to get there at two for pictures. Well, that means you need to get there at 20 minutes to two to get your flowers and hug people and find out where you need to be so that you're ready to be in front of the camera at two. So that was at, at one point, you know, when, I'd had some chaos and weddings and late things. I was like, how can I improve that? So that was one for me. I read a book. This is about the introvert and actually the value of being an introvert, especially as a salesperson. It might have been called introvert. So the book suggests that actually introverts have an advantage because you're better listeners and you're paying attention and focusing on other people rather than using all that extrovertedness to kind of get attention or, you know, be seen that there's advantages both ways. I can see why they make the argument, but I can also counter that with a lot of introverts don't go out. And when they do go, because they're so introverted, they're not really paying attention to what's happening. Okay. But there's some who actually they'll pay their people watch. And there are a lot of extroverts who also people watch. So I wouldn't, you know, you know, I wouldn't bet my last dollar on <laughs> that, 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 that 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 theory. Okay. But but I can understand why that person would make that uh, assessment. Yes. Or maybe the alternate what I'm suggesting is that can be used mm -hmm. to their advantage rather than Oh, I'm I'm an, you know, I'm an introvert, so I'm not going to be good at sales. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, 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 yeah. So if a person know that there's a strength to it, also. Yeah. So yeah, they they're taught how to do that. I think that's very. I would encourage that. Like, if you're an introvert, use that to your advantage. I'll say that mm -hmm. much. Use it to your advantage and figure out how can I learn by watching. I mean, right. Yeah. So I get that. Yeah. All right. So my next question or topic around your superpower is education that you believe in the value of education you are an educator so can you share about 
why education is important? Um, right. or, when it comes to education, like right now, we're in 2023, and the access to information is so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is swipe your phone and there's stuff there for you. But the difference is sometimes having someone's personal experience, like, okay, there's too much information out there to begin with. And you don't always know what's right, what's not right, what's the reverse, what's practical. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people who've taught how to do something, but they've never done it themselves. They're teaching stuff they've heard, they're teaching theory versus let me teach you something that I've done, practically done myself. Example, there are a lot of SEO. I've been to a lot of things, you know, workshops, conferences. Somebody talk about SEO. And you go to their website, there's nothing SEO friendly there. I'm like, what, what do you mean? Like, are you teaching theory? Whereas I can show you step by step what I did to help my SEO. Mm -hmm. And right when I was an amateur, there wasn't a lot of information out there. You have to like fight to try to like, where can I get this information? Now it's so much information out there and people are getting burnt left and right. A lot of scammers are out there because they prey on people's ignorance and, and not knowing that ignorance isn't a bad thing. Like my mom hates the word ignorance because she <laughs> thinks, I know it's just you not knowing or having information. You're ignorant right. to that subject matter. But I want to make sure that people know and photographers know there are legitimate people out there who care. They want to give back. There's a reason why if someone asks me to be on a podcast, I'm always like, sure, it might not always be convenient, but if it's to give back to the community, I'm always going to adjust my schedule to make, make it happen. And this happens on a regular because I just know the value in providing real information. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like none fancy about me. It's nothing super special other than this 10, my 10th year full time. I've done a lot, seen a lot, experienced a lot. And if I can help you avoid some pitfalls, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. And I'm still a working photographer. Right. I'm not somebody who I shot for 10 years and no longer shoot. And I'm trying to teach you stuff that I did 15 years ago. No, mm -hmm. I'm still a working practicing photographer who's to adjust my process along the way. So how can people figure out who to learn from, who has walked the walk? I think you have to ask questions. Uh, like a question I'll ask is, if you're looking to find, like say, to learn from someone, find out who's learned from them in the past. Where are they now? Mm -hmm. What are things that they enjoyed? What are things they didn't enjoy? I mean, okay. ask them, if you had to do this again, would you do it? Why or why not? It's like so going for an interview. Yeah, it's like going for an interview. If someone's interviewing you, ask them, how long have you been at this job? Like, what keeps you at this job? Is it the pay? Is it the systems? Is it the relationships? What is it? But mm -hmm. you have to ask these questions. Because again, there's a lot of people out there who they're selling a lot of stuff and they're borrowing that information from some of the place. Right. Now, like in my coaching, there are clients who, let's say, want to become commercial photographers. I haven't done commercial work, but I'm a learner. And so like at WPPI, I went to the class on commercial photography with someone who's been doing it so that I have more information and support. Um, you know, I wedding photographer, portrait photographers, I have decades of experience. So that's easy peasy for me. But I love to learn from people who are lifelong learners. There was a quote last night on um, Jeopardy. I like to watch Jeopardy to exercise my brain. And it was the, fill in the blank. Uh, I think this was Shakespeare. A, a good teacher is someone who is also, and then it was like a, a lifelong learner or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm paraphrasing. So that's one of my perspectives too, is if I see people out there still learning, still growing, then I know the things that are coming in new, they can share that yeah, with absolutely. me, even if they haven't done everything. Yeah, like sometimes in 2021, I was on Clubhouse and I was in a <laughs> science, science of food room, like a food science room. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I have no business in there, but because I'm, I was interested in like, you know, food and what do you call it? Culinary arts. I'm learning things about it. Mm -hmm. I sp spent like two hours in that room learning about the science of food. And I'm like, and I spent another hour like in a winemaking room about the business of winemaking. Because mm -hmm. you never know. Again, when I'm in these spaces, 
as I'm learning information, get, gathering thought, my gather, gathering things, I'm like, you never know who can use this information later on. So now I know if somebody needs the specialty wine, I know the guy Norvell is a winemaker in New Orleans. He has his wines in Walmart stores. Good. He has his information. Had I not been in that room, I would have known there's a Norvell guy who also does real estate who makes wines. Ah, so that helps you, that relationship connection. And, and, and it ties back to relationships. Yeah. But I'm out, but I'm learning this educational stuff because you never know what you can learn could be of value to somebody else. Right. Right. Because over time, things that become so ordinary to you could be extraordinary to the next person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you don't know unless you're learning, keep learning this value of education. The value of education is priceless. Right. Right. But you have to be willing to want to learn different things outside of what you know. The value of education is priceless. That's a quotable quote. But what yeah, I like is it's not just that you're curious about only areas that specifically relate know. to your business. Yes. <laughs> Yo, let me tell you, right? I told my wife yesterday, I'm the most talented person most people know. Okay. And I didn't say braggingly because I'm entering a DJ competition at the end of the month. Oh. Yeah. And I told the organizers, I'm coming back for my crown. I was, it was stolen from me five years ago, coming back for it. <laughs> and as I'm practicing, I'm like, as a wedding photographer, right? I have so much more about me that people don't know. They know the one part of me. Like I told the guys on Clubhouse, you guys know the Clubhouse me. You guys don't know the other facets of me. Those who are really close to me, they know I do several things and mm -hmm. do it very well. But you have to be in my certain spaces to know what I do outside of what you, I'm known for. The camera was just a, a key to unlock many doors mm -hmm. that allowed me to travel in. Right. I have another client. I have a rental car business that I run. Really? As I'm like, yeah, because again, Again, I do a lot of things. This is the land of opportunity. In my country of Antigua and Barbuda, the opportunities are hard to come by. Mm. Very hard to come by. Unless you're in government, I can't even say education anymore because the opportunities are not that accessible. So while I'm in this country, I'm going to take, take advantage of everything I know how to do very well. And so how does running a rental car company fit in with the things you know how to do well? Because I'm an entrepreneur and mm -hmm. I have all five stars for a reason because customer relationships are not a service, taking care of customers. I mean, it's this is the person's repeat person here who messaged me. She was late booking it. Somebody else just booked it. She wanted it. You know what I mean? So it's just knowing how to talk to people and having relationships. They come back. Mm -hmm. It's like photography. You take care of your clients while they might get married one time. They come back from maternity session. I have a session next month. We did the engagement session, did the wedding did their baby announcement, not doing a maternity session. That's four from one client. I have a proposal that's due this afternoon for this lady, he's his, his senior now. I photographed them when he was like, like 10, 11. I photographed the, him when he was 16, two years ago, that did the sister when she turned 12, did the other brother when he turned, I think 10, and now mm -hmm. he's graduating. That's five right now. These relationships and take care of your, your clients, they matter. Right. And it, that that is stuff that's you can take that to any part of business, be rental car business, be the food business, be the music business. Mm -hmm. These things that you can trans transferable skill sets. Got it. I have a client that I did uh, her oldest first communion and then a family portrait and then the other five kids first communions, the youngest kids baby portraits. Then all the high school seniors and another family portrait. And before that, and then after that, their anniversary. And when the kids were teenagers, you know, somewhere in there. And then the first one's wedding. And nice. the second one, it was in Switzerland. And thank God I didn't go. I was going to, but it, it was... I think right at the shutdown, the COVID shutdown. So I might've been stuck in Europe for months, but I arranged a photographer and then I built her wedding album. And nice. yeah, if I think about the lifetime value of that one client that I created at the beginning, a nice relationship with as you're advocating here, and she was loyal to me, she wouldn't go anywhere else. There you go. That's where it should be. I like how this conversation has kind of weaved in and out and pulled 
from all the different uh, topics and kind of fit together in a really lovely pattern. Does that make sense? What I just said. Yeah, yeah it's just as many, education the, 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 many facets of me. Yeah, and it all ties back to the same thing. But again, it's just it's just the immigrant story. I mean, I just mm. see opportunities and I do what I can to learn about it, pull the trigger, make it happen. And even if you don't, and for the people that are watching, listening, even if you don't have all the answers to it, it's okay to just jump. Mm. Okay. When I got laid off as an architect, even when I got laid off, photography was not part of my plan. I didn't know that you could have a life in photography. Like, like who wants to spend a day with a camera? I mean, that's something you do for fun. Mm-hmm. And, you know, weddings and traveling, speaking on stages and podcasts. And back then, podcast wasn't even a thing, right? But I'm like, it's just the more you learn and grow, you become a better person, better business owner. And you become a better mentor to those who look up to you and you give back to them. And at the heart of it all, I just want to be, I want, I want to leave, leave a legacy behind for my, for my family and have a good name in this industry and give back to those who, you know, never had somebody to give, you know, give to them. So. Got it. I love it. It's funny that you shared some things that, that people don't know about you because as I was just, you know, brushing my teeth and getting ready for the day, the idea popped in my head. Oh, maybe on my podcast, I should ask, it'd be fun to ask a question. What is something most people don't know about you? And I didn't even have to ask you that question. <laughs> yeah, I can, te- I can teach Gordon Ramsay how to cook. Yeah, I can too. Okay. Oh, let me tell you, I love a nice jerk chicken. I love my rice and peas. I love my fried plantain. I love my, my Tashawn version of my Jamaican jerk pasta. In fact, if you go on my Facebook, I made a post as a selfie of myself and a photographer in Vegas. And I said, only a friend will be up with you at four in the morning to get ready for five o'clock in a cold shoot. And the response was, now it's, now it's time for that, that reggae pasta. Mm. <laughs> because she's been, I made it for a couple years ago when I ran my food business and she's been dying to have it ever since. So the opportunity she gets to help me She's like, my payment will be that food. Awesome. So when does she get to collect? If I say it now, I gotta like she can hold me to it. <laughs> but no, by the by summer she'll get get it. Yeah. Because I made it for her before. I got it done and she was out of town. I'm like, you're oh. out of town? Like, I guess we'll enjoy this then. Yeah. Because it's a it's a vegan jerk pasta sauce that I make. Because like mm. I don't do dairy. So the sauce is vegan and it's so mm, so good. But, you know, of course, put chicken in there so it's no longer vegan. But the sauce is, for those lactose intolerant, the sauce yeah. is to die for. Yeah. All right. Well, I have two questions for you before we go. One, I know you have, you're part of a workshop and that you have a special offer for our listeners. So what's the workshop and how do they get? Uh... It is the Resolve Workshop. It's a storytelling and lighting workshop based in Mexico City. January 7th to the 11th, 2024. This is our third version of it. We had the second version this past January. It was two months ago, Mexico City. And the first version was February of 2020, right before the shutdown happened. Oh. Talk about timing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have four or five coaches. We're all part of the Foundation Fearless Photographers community. And they gave me the blessings to have a version. Because in my community, we don't see a lot of story, like heavy storytelling. It's a lot of you know, beautiful portraits and so forth. But storytelling isn't something that we focus on. And I wanted to kind of bring that side of photography to the community. Okay. And spoke to the the foundation leader and gave me the blessing to bring it over. At least our our spin on it. Mm -hmm. And it's a very hard workshop to be a part of. There's always an emotional breakdown by someone because it is overwhelming. It's nothing pretty about the workshop. There's nothing sexy. There's no flowers or beautiful brides and dresses. No tablescapes. It's like a boot camp for storytellers and you give an assignment, you come back, you shoot all day long, come back to get feedback from your coaches. You, you get all, you know, it's very real and feedback that photographers need. Some get in their feelings about it, but they say, Hey, like leave your ego at the door. You're here, but you spend money to come here, get the feedback. And they go back out again the following day, spend a day in the field doing all their assignments and they come back and have a final presentation. But the last two that I've done, there've been a couple mental breakdowns and they'll tell you like they needed that because they realized 
it was way past their comfort zone mm. and it needs to be pushed past it. Even the last one, there's some egos that arrived on the scene. Sure. I, I'm, you know, know what I'm doing. When they in the field, the assignment kind of humbled them. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, yeah, maybe I should take my time and really soak up what's being taught here. Yeah, so it's, uh, and it was supposed to be my last, last one, but they told me, no, you can't stop now. <laughs> this is way too good to just end it. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, and the coaches agreed with them. And the coaches, Charmy uh, Pena Patel, Charmy Patel Pena, okay. uh, Kanayo Debe, Darrell Hoshing, and myself, to Sean mm-hmm. Jackson. Awesome. And so what's the, I know you have a special discount. Yeah, so like anyone that. who registers, by, I have 13 spots left. Anyone who registers will save, I think, 250 I told you. Mm-hmm. 250 on the registration. You have to mention, you know, Lucy in the, when you register. Because okay. you can, anybody who register, because you register doesn't mean you get a seat anyway. It's an application process. Got it. Because you want to, we have to screen every person that comes in. Because it's not for everyone. Right. When I screened the last class, they were like, why are you not trying to take our money? It's not about the money. If it was about the money, we'd have 50 photographers there. But it's a very intimate workshop. I want to make sure that it's the right fit for you. Mm-hmm. Because... I'm very protective of my name and my brand. And the last thing I want you to say is, that workshop, was it wasn't worth it. It was nothing, you know. No, this workshop is going to kick your butt. And I want to make sure you understand what you're up for, even though I don't give you the full details. You know, mm-hmm. it's very challenging. Yeah. But you'll, you'll come out better than when you first came in. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So it's resolveworkshop.com. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. And then last question. Um, Either is there something you haven't shared with us that after we part, you'd be like, oh, I wish I'd have mentioned that. Or do you have a parting thought to leave us with? Yeah, well, I sold my company on Sunday to Google. So this would be my last year as a photographer. Wow. Yeah, they um, the deal was sold it and everything finalizes midday tomorrow for 250 million dollars so i think my attorney said they kind of shortchanged me a couple mil but i'll take it so what's the lesson in that besides that my jaw is on the floor that that. you have to learn how to learn how to tell stories and just you know i made that story up but oh (laughs) (laughs) that's good well you know it's not impossible though it's not impossible but have a compelling story and you never know the action people will take, but compelling, but you know, actual factual stories. Okay. But here's a true story though. When I was laid off as an architect in 2011, January 26, 2011, I was working on another business and I sent a proposal to Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and Amex. And the VP of technology of MasterCard called me and she said, and in 2011, yeah, she was a, as a woman, she said, if you can figure out this missing piece of the puzzle, it would change your life and your family's life forever. And did you figure it out? I could, I'm not a tech person, so I couldn't figure it out. Oh. But it's, yeah, but it's, again, there's lots of stuff about me that goes on behind the scenes outside of photography. Yeah, which is probably true for all of us, but some mm-hmm. of us more than others. So before we say goodbye to our amazing guest, reminder that you want to stay listening so I can do my little wrap up for you. And to show Thank you so much for saying yes and sharing your perspectives on so many things. I'm sure people who've listened are just like, he's opened my mind to so many things. So I really appreciate you being on the show. It is my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And stay tuned for all my friends that are coming on too. Yeah, this is awesome. All right, well, thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon. Yeah. I'll uh, see you guys. Find me online. Okay, doke. Bye. Au revoir. So before I do my wrap up, and I've already said goodbye to Mr. Jackson. Wasn't he awesome? A lot of different perspectives that I appreciate. Remember, you can find my show also on YouTube. The Profitable Photographer is what you search for. Get in touch if you have any questions. You want to just chat for 20 minutes and get some encouragement from you. No pushy trying to book you for anything unless it seems like that's something that you want to explore 
but I just love to hear from people. Oh, I want to tell you a story. I hope you're still listening. <laughs> this just made me so happy. When I was leaving the hotel at WPPI, I was passing by a, a little gift shop and I'd seen these shiny cups with straws every day, several times a day as I walked past the store. Something said, huh, do I want a shiny cup to take home? So I walked in the store and a woman came up to me and said, oh my gosh, Lucy Dumas, I listen to your podcast all of the time and it's such good information and thank you so much. And so I want to give a shout out to Jill because I know she's listening and anybody else that listens on a regular basis or if this is your first time, it means so much to me that you're listening, you're getting value. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love suggestions about guests, somebody you'd like me to have a good conversation with. So, you know, I love those coincidences. So anywho, Tishorn talked about, first of all, he got started in photography by accident because he'd learned some things because he's a learner, which I appreciate and bought a Canon Rebel just to see if he could use what he'd learned. And then one thing led to the next. He lost his job as an architect, was laid off. And what's unfolded is this great wedding business and so much more. So he talked about the importance of building relationships and connecting with people. We also talked about how not to be a pushy salesperson and his biggest focus is that we need a system. And a system is an organic thing that we keep refining as we discover issues or ways that we could do something that uh, makes selling or our photography or whatever else we're doing that much better. So create systems, write them down, upgrade them. He talked about the importance of listening to our clients and asking questions, um, things like, do you have hobbies, different kinds of things. And that for people who are naturally shy, having some things that you do every time is a way to kind of relax into it and not feel, you know, like, I don't know, you're in a, in the ocean with big waves, but you're in your calm seas. I just made that up right now. And he said, it's okay to jump if you don't completely know how to do something. And I don't know anybody that has become successful in this business, highly profitable, that didn't do some jumping and hoped that the parachute would open or, you know, that there'd be a trampoline on the ground <laughs> when you jump. You know, we've got to push ourselves. And I loved also that we talked about the importance of just always learning, always growing in all kinds of ways. So thank you for learning from this show. You can always get in touch with me at lucydumascoaching.com, Lucy with an I, and stay tuned for more awesome guests. Bye for now. You have been listening to The Highly Profitable Photographer with Lucy Dumas. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe, review, and share. To connect one-on-one -on -one and learn more about our coaching programs, just go to lucydumascoaching.com. Until next time, go have fun photographing and selling your work.